G'day, mate. What's your name? I'm Tom Whitcomb, and I... You didn't ask the other question. I, I preempted it. Yeah. Do you, do you want me to ask it, or do you just want to go? You go, you go. What's the question? And what do you do? Oh, yeah, I work in advertising. So this And is, then this sometimes this... do stand-up comedy. <laughs> Hello, welcome back to another episode of Crab Workcast. My name's Andrew Barnett. Thanks for joining me. Now, this week's guest is Tom Whitcomb, who is, uh, well, as he said, in advertising, but I know him best from stand-up comedy. So if you like uh, your stand-up with short, uh, dark jokes, then uh, I highly recommend you check out Tom. Uh, he's very funny, very uh, particular joke writer. Um, this chat gets very, very comedy nerdy. So if you're into that, you'll probably enjoy it. Uh, if you're not into that, well... Have, give it a crack anyway. Maybe you'll enjoy it. Who knows? Uh, now, if you want to follow Tom, you can follow him on Instagram or TikTok at Tom Whitcomb Comedy. Uh, he's also got a YouTube special called Ignorant. You can check that out. And uh, you can also uh, listen to his podcast, which is called Flog Cabin. So uh, check that out wherever you get your podcasts. Um, if you're enjoying this podcast, please do like, subscribe, all that good sort of stuff. And if you're not already following me on socials, please do. I'm at Andrew Barnett Comedy on Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook. Um, other than that, please, uh, yeah, enjoy this. This is my chat with Tom Whitkin. This isn't your first time being crowd worked, is it? <laughs> you just had the job loaded as I well. I do it a lot more. I get crowd work a lot more than I crowd work, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you do too. So you you let's start with the stand up. I am interested in the advertising stuff too because that's that's an interesting world mm. in terms of um, man. Like I know a few people in advertising, and it sounds like one of those jobs. Like when you start, you're like, oh, there's all this creativity and all this fun stuff. But geez, they work you hard. Yeah. So I'm not actually I'm not in the creative side of it yet. I'm trying to move into it. But yeah, like I see, I tell the creatives what to do, and yeah, they work really hard. Because I think you don't have final say on anything, right? Yeah. Like, you make a thing. Like, I think this is pretty good. And then someone's like, no, nah, I don't reckon. Go again. We need it tomorrow. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. 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 That's, it's, yeah. As opposed to stand up, where I suppose you have complete creative control in a lot of ways. Yeah. And a lot of the time, even though you know it's not good enough, you keep it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because it's all you got. <laughs> yeah. I remember because I did uh, the Melbourne Comedy Festival this year. And in my mind, I was like, you know, I'm going to come back after the show and the next one I'll listen to the show and I'll find the bits I need to tighten up didn't do it fucking once you know <laughs> you have those bits where you're like oh yeah I should in real time like I probably won't tell that tonight because it just keeps not working but like I thought I would be really diligent and you know not really and rewrite that's it's it is hard in that way to the creativity to be to force yourself to be creative mm. when there's just no like I say sometimes it's like if there's no blood going to it it's so hard to get anything going with the bit mm. it's like you got to what sometimes it is a patience game where you just got to wait you know that there's something there yeah I'm not not there yet where I can work it out but you just got to have sort of have faith and I won't throw it away completely maybe maybe it'll come to me maybe the solution will come yeah I'm probably um, I probably almost in the opposite and that I, I like hold on to it too tightly like I'm gonna fucking railroad I'm gonna work it out and I think it probably just kills it but yeah I know what you mean like I think sometimes you need to kind of let let it go for a little bit let it float around and then it'll kind of come back when it's ready to come back or you go oh yeah what happened to that thing and it, you look at it from a new perspective I guess so how long ago did you start when did you start about seven years ago. Wow. Yeah. So yes, I think September will be seven years. Seven years. So what? What was it? The were you working in advertising at the time, or you? Like, no, it's you're only young. I'm thirty two. Thirty two. Okay, you look young. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So, so twenty five. Yeah. Just what? Were you, what were you, you weren't working in advertising. What were you up to? Oh, uh, similar. Like I was in a different kind of agency. It wasn't quite advertising, but similar marketing yep. stuff. Uh, so yeah, I was before that, I was kind of, I sort of, my music was the kind of the dream before that, but I never really pushed that that hard. Really? And I had mates who did. And I lived with one guy in particular who was like super talented, super driven, knew more about music than me, was better at every instrument. Like I played one instrument, he was better at four instruments than I was at one. And just like cared a lot more. And I remember things like, you know, 
going into the kitchen at two o'clock in the morning and he'd be sitting there behind his laptop like working on logic like trying to make a song i was like oh i don't give a shit about this nearly as much as this guy does and so that was always i still kind of had it as like i think because i wasn't very happy at work i kind of wanted to believe there was some big path or purpose or whatever um and then comedy kind of ended up being my version of that eventually not but probably still don't work as hard as he does but I think that's the thing, like, we're so lucky we're in an industry where people just don't work that hard. Like, <laughs> think about how hard musicians work. Like, you hear stories about, like, Tom Morello from Raging Against the Machine studying at Harvard and, and playing guitar nine hours a day. It's like, no, none of us are doing that. Yeah, no, but, well, maybe, maybe the odd guitar act. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you think the guys from Tripod are just, like, at home with a metronome playing classical gas? Yeah, I don't, yeah, it, it is, it's a different sort of a, a beast in that like there's people that work really hard but it's not like it's not like where you can like a musician can sit and do the mm. scales they can learn the technique they can they can practice all that at home there's really no practice at home there's you can write mm. you can sit and write you can look for um look for inspiration you can do so, but then there's really the practice has to be done in front of people. Yeah. Have you heard like every now and then I hear about a comedian who claims to work on it like a nine to five? Like Daniel Sloss, I remember hearing mm. on an interview saying that when he was like nineteen or whatever and he decided he was gonna be like full time comedy, nothing else, his mum basically said, All right, well if you're gonna do that, then treat it like a job and your Monday to Friday nine to five and he would sit at the like coffee table or they sit at the dining room table and just like work. Do you reckon that's real? Ah, I'm trying to think how old Sloss was when I first met him. Um, that's it, funny. That he, like, he's like in certain circles here, right? Like, yeah. Because he came out here a lot when he was I, I remember him very, like, yeah, when he was, yeah, he would have been, yeah, maybe 19. Yeah, right. And, um, always super talented, yeah. super, super well written, that sort of stuff. But I suppose... He, it didn't strike me as those days where, you know, you, he was out here working. Like, I remember being in Perth for the comedy festival over there and a bunch of us, like, hanging out with him at night. It didn't strike me that he'd spent the whole day yeah, okay. sitting at a, But then that's too a life. So yeah, you sure. don't know um, how real that is. He certainly works very hard. And he was, he was always very, like, he's a guy who was, um, like, his stuff was prepared like it wasn't mm. like you walked on stage and went oh he's just thinking of this off the top of his head you watch him there was there was real mm. so he'd obviously worked very hard at it i don't know i don't know i think that there's different ways to approach it like i don't think that that style of writing doesn't work necessarily for me mm. um because i like that there are elements of it where you know you you do when i when we were working at when i was working at fox and we we're working on those shows you do you're doing those sort of hours because there's a deadline. You've got to have something. Mm. So you're working on something. But even then, like we often hit like creative blocks and you do, okay, let's get up, let's go for a walk. Mm. Just go talk about something else for an hour and come back and then the creative problem was solved. Like it's sometimes, it is those hours, but it doesn't look like, you know, oh, I'm sitting in front of a spreadsheet just mm. doing the, you know, I don't know what people in front of spreadsheets do, to be honest. <laughs> I don't think they know most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that there is, you can do that, but I don't know if, I don't know. Yeah, everyone's, I think you've got to find your process that works for you. Yeah, for sure. But it's, it's definitely a thing where you need to approach it like this is a job if you want to really, mm. you know, really get the most you can out of it in a lot of ways. Yeah, because no one else is holding you to account, right? It's all you. That's, that's the thing. And that's where, like, everyone, you know, we, we all sort of look at the festival model here and go, oh, it's, it's tough, it's tough. But it does give you that. If you, you know, you've put your show in or a festival, you've got a deadline, you need mm. to write. Yeah. It pushes you to churn out new material. Whether, you know, that it's best to be churning out a new hour every year or not, that depends on the individual. But yeah. um, it's certainly, you know, it, you've got to give yourself deadlines and give yourself some sort of accountability. Otherwise, I don't know about you, but it's very it's very easy to, to let all that go. Yeah. I Like, I've, um, I think having always had a full-time job whilst doing comedy has kind of forced me to be disciplined with it. So I I write every morning for an hour, set a timer and just go. Because I don't, like, I can't just go on stage and talk. It just doesn't work. And well, let's talk about your style of comedy because mm -hmm. you're very much short jokes. You're drawn to kind of dark topics. 
that sort of stuff. So the short joke, yeah, like you're not a let's go on stage, hey, g'day, mate, what are you up to? You don't, you don't really crowd work. You don't do that sort of stuff. Yeah, well, because like when I started, it was really the dark. Like it was that Jimmy Carr thing of like every other joke, I was a pedophile. And, <laughs> and it's like, how do you do that and also just be like, and what do you do, mate? You know what yeah, I mean? Like yeah. it's just a, I guess Jimmy Carr does it. But I could never quite my jokes were so character based and I was also very deadpan at that time like I, I saw like breaking as uh, a sin like I was trying to avoid doing that which I don't feel as much anymore and so I found it very hard and still do to walk the line between crowd work and bits mm. so like I find now every now and then I'll be forced into crowd work because something happens and you need to address it or someone heckles or whatever and then I find it so hard. I, I can do that and get laughs, but I find it very hard to switch back into bits from there. Like, I just, it feels so unnatural to me. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, like, a lot of it was by necessity because the jokes were so non-reality based to bring it, I found it very hard to be real. Does that make sense? Yeah, you, you're, when, you, when you're painting a picture, your jokes are set in a very heightened fictional world. Mm then you can't in between jokes be relaxed yeah like on stage you can't be natural like tom off stage on stage because and, and i think as well i'm very very high status on stage in a like kind of like everyone else is stupid and i don't give a shit about anyone and i don't talk to people that way like that's not how i converse like i'm mm. actually i think i'm quite like submissive in conversation and like apologetic and stuff and it just it clashes too much mm. i think I'd have to work out how to like freestyle as whoever that guy is or yeah. tell jokes as whoever I am, I guess. Yeah, it's, 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 I think that you, you may come closer together as time goes on, but mm. you also, I, I don't know, like it's a style, like it's a style that works for you. It's a style that you're drawn to for a reason. And I don't, I don't think, I mean, I, I don't think there's one single way to do it. No. But why was it that? Why? What was it about that style? Who was? Who we? Was it Jimmy Carr? Were those your guys you really enjoyed, or was that just what you felt like you could most naturally do? So I liked. Yeah. I mean, Jimmy Carr and Jezelnik were definitely big, big influences in like what I what I was doing. Um, but I really. Oh, and Dimitri Martin, I really loved. Um, yeah. I really liked Tim Vine as well. Like when I started, I did a lot more sort of like stupid pun stuff. Um, which again, I think just clashed with if it was too dark and then too light, it was kind of weird. Um, but then I also liked, I loved Jim Jeffries, I loved um, Arch Barker, like there was some more storytelling stuff in there. I think I always, I always loved jokes, like yeah. I always loved joke jokes and street jokes. I remember my dad telling a lot of jokes. I remember like there were a few at different times, like joke websites where I would like, there was one I talk about a bit, which is um, I lived in the UK in 2010 when I was 18. And there was this uh, website called Sycopedia. And so Sycopedia was a crowdsourced joke website that was like real times. So, like every day they would have the best jokes of the day. And from my memory at the time, they were pretty good. And I think I've looked back and they weren't. But like yeah. it, was, it was instant reaction to world events and it always rewarded dark stuff. Um, and I remember like they had a top 100 and I just like memorized them. It became like a joke box. Uh, sorry, a jukebox for these jokes. And um, joke box, joke good box. Name, I know, but you didn't like, like a pun, don't you? Yeah, I didn't mean to. I didn't like that. <laughs> um, but so yeah, it's it, like I I think I kind of inherently learned that sort of joke structure of like set up punchline and yep. rule of three and whatever. And so I think that was like the most natural way for me to go was like okay, well this is clearly a joke. Like, and I think especially when I started, there was something very reassuring about being like, all right, I'm gonna go up there with thirty jokes in six minutes or whatever. And if they don't like that one, will I get to get them on the next one? And if they don't like that, will I get another chance? Like, it's it's very safe. Whereas if you yeah. go up there and you're like, I'm going to tell a story, and you lose them the first minute, you're like, well, fuck, I'm stuck. Yeah. Yeah, it's... it's uh, But the, there's also a lot more writing mm. your way. That's the... It's, the so it's an interesting sort of a dichotomy. Like, especially when you first start to... I think it's easier to... Like, you talked about being in that heightened character. Like, it's it's not really you... You were you would get every second joke you're a pedophile, mm. and realistically, every joke you're a pedophile in real life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my told stories are just about me fucking kids, yeah, and they a, get told. Look, it's a full time. But they don't. <laughs> it's a full. <laughs> oh Jesus! <laughs> um, but that's um, that that like it's there is a feeling of safety when you go. Okay, well, you know, if they don't like the jokes that 
not they're not me. rejecting the jokes. They're, they're not. They're rejecting the jokes, not me. Yeah, and also I think it's like there's something about very formulaic and mathematical about that, where it's like, well, clearly I can I can understand why someone would laugh at this. If that mm. makes sense, like it kind of makes sense at a really base mathematical level. I, I get a lot of security out of that. Um, so I, I think that's... Whenever there's... I don't know, there's that thing of sometimes you watch... It's still really, really good comedy, and you're like, I don't know if I could explain why this is funny, but it is. Yeah. There's something very safe about I know I could explain why this is funny. It's because you thought I was meaning this thing, but I meant that thing, or whatever. Yeah, there's... there's it's interesting, there's different approaches to it, and I think yours, you're very structured and analytical mm. is that how you like were you like that growing up were you like a were yeah you drawn sure. to maths and yeah i really like maths I like puzzles like crosswords and like sudoku and all that sort of stuff um so i think i get a lot of like satisfaction out of that um i think also the music thing like i used to really like lyric writing and i think that's kind of similar mm. um so what, music, what what uh instrument did you play guitar guitar yeah so I loved, like, I think if I could have been anything, I would have loved to have been, like, an Alex Turner or a Noel Gallagher, like, really solid songwriting sort of mm. stuff. Um, you know, I think that's, like, you know, I was all, always more of a Paul McCartney guy than a John Lennon guy. And I think Paul McCartney was all structure and, like, composition. And Lennon was much more emotion and personality. Yeah. And I think that's probably how I see it. Like, I, I have a lot of respect for structure and form and, like... Um, uh, yeah, like just co the creation of something that is kind of neat and and do you know what I mean? Like it, it's not you know I think John Lennon's thing was so much about self expression, uh, whereas I think Paul McCartney was so much more about structure. To yeah. me, creating creating the the music sort of that that travel like the, with the emotion can travel on top of. I guess yeah. Mm. It's. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting sort of uh, way to look at it. Like, and it's interesting that you you noted like the the similarities between you went from maths to music because music is much more structured, mm. um, or there, there's rules to music. Yeah, whereas, for sure. And there are rules to comedy, but there's I think there's probably less of them. I feel like it's the difference between music has almost laws, and we've got conventions. Mm. It's like the difference between. Um, you know, like a regular presidency and a Trump presidency. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> yeah, like yeah, yeah. Comedy's the the one where you go, oh, this this actually, yeah, they can just do whatever you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, I think so. But then I think I would say I've always kind of stuck more to the rules. Mm. Um, I was talking to someone about this recently, actually, that uh, I was doing a gig with Ben Elwood, and I think Ben Elwood thrives like two thirds into a show because I think if you're an audience, especially in Australia, where you Com uh, crowds are a little bit less comedy savvy they're kind of learning the rules in real time yeah and in like a well-run show a crowd goes in and they're like oh, okay so what's what's this thing and they're like oh it's this and then act after act kind of either expands the boundaries a little bit but also kind of sets the formula of like oh this is how this works they open with this and they close with that and whatever and then Elwood kind of comes in and just sort of tears all the rules down he just sort of does what he wants. He's the, the the boundary between audience and stage is far less clear with him. Like he's kind of constantly doing bits, but also never doing bits. Like it's just less. It's hard to get a grasp on, and I always find it very hard to follow that because I feel like I'm so inside the rules, and someone's just like knocked all the blocks over, and then you just kind of come up and like set them up again, and like, wait, why are you? You you don't have to do that. We just saw. Yeah. I so yeah, I think I've always like really coloured inside the lines and 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 played with the rules pretty. Clearly for me. I, I like that, the, yeah, Elwood I find is, he's a bit like, I always used to enjoy, um, if we were on a gig together, I'd, if he wasn't a bit agitated, I'd try and get him a bit agitated before he went up. Because he, mm. I, and I've said this to him, I said, you're always best when you're just a little off kilter. Like yeah. when you've just been pushed off, something is bugging you. Yeah. And then, yeah, it, it, but I can see that, that structure, that, so you, you do you still find though that, that's hard to follow that energy, or do you find as you're going longer or whatever, you're able to? Uh, it's definitely harder, but it's more manageable. This is like what we talked about when we did the store last, like following Jess. I think mm. Jess Fuchs does a very similar thing, like kind of breaks the rules a lot. I think that d delineation between crowd and, and performer is a really, um, 
it's a really important thing in comedy. Not as in it has to be that way, but it defines the way everything goes. Mm. I think Jess, again, we, we so we did a um, run a gig together at the store, and Jess was on before me every night and was crushing. But I think she does this really great thing where it feels very chaotic, but it's kind of the audience is always sort of implicated in it. Whereas I'm kind of like, I would sort of do the same thing whether the audience was there or not. Yeah, it's... I don't, like, I think... I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to think back to the first time we worked together and I have a vague memory of um, you at a gig. I dropped in at like an early Magic Mike. Oh, okay. Maybe. Yeah, right. A like long, the old school, like the, the old school. Monkey Magic. Yes, Monkey Magic. Mm. And um, and I was just was there and I was watching and there was a bunch of people I hadn't seen mm. and because uh, I wasn't doing as many sort of mics or being out, out in the sort of scene as much. And I remember you having just being very much just the joke, joke guy. Yeah. And I remember watching it and I, I think I said to you afterwards, that's like really good keep going because it's you're completely different to everyone else that's doing what everyone else is doing. Oh, that's nice. But um that was, it's nice of you to remember the compliment. <laughs> um, but um that no but I remember like at that stage, like and, uh, to watch you, the difference between watching you now and watching you then is there is like you will acknowledge the audience more than mm. like that was very much early days um you behind the wall. Yeah. Like, are they, do you find this little subtle things where, you, do you ever just, like, sometimes I think it's, like, for me, it's like, I talk about, like, depending on the audience you're with, sometimes it's about just helping them access what you're talking about. Yeah. So just making little concessions, to make it easy, meet them sort of part way. Yeah. I think there's a couple of things. I think, I mean, I've, um, this is a piece of advice Muggleton always gave me, and I think he's right. I think what's... Sort of shifted is how much I'm comfortable. Can you do Muggleton's voice when you do it, please? No, I should do that, but yeah. no, I can't. Can you do it in post? Hi, man. Ah, what you got to do, man? Uh. That just sounds like your voice. Yeah, but it's a little bit. <laughs> uh, no, it's just like uh, um, Jezel Nick, and I think it's it's definitely if you're doing like if you're doing jo like here's a joke, here's a joke, here's a joke. I think over time I've sort of string jokes together in a way that makes it seem like I'm being conversational, but I'm not. They're just mm. jokes in order. Um, but he will do a joke, and then it feels like almost just as much time he will spend comment like commentating the joke or commentating the audience's response to it. And I think that is, it's worth doing that just in terms of, I, I think it's, to your point, it's like a concession to the audience of like, hey, I know how you are feeling about this. Like, I'm aware of you. Yeah. And then I think the other thing, and again, it took me a really long time, I hated breaking on stage. Like, I really, I always wanted to be deadpan. I, I wanted to just be sort of, like, completely oblivious to the idea that anything that I was saying could ever be wrong. Um, but, and when I would break, comics really liked it, which kind of annoyed me more, because it's like, yeah, but you, you're not the, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, of course you like it, but it's like, because you know what I'm trying to do. Like, you like... In my mind, I guess I kind of took it as like, you like that I couldn't hold it together. Not that... Not that me not breaking was good. Um, but I think... And I think about this about Tosh, especially, someone who's, like, navigated being offensive really well. It's like, it's so clear he's just fucking around. Yeah. Like, he is so unapologetic about it because it's like... I'm, I remember I saw him in, like, January 2020, right after the bushfires... And it was like, um, you know, it, it, they had literally, we got the first rain in weeks after nothing but smoke. And he comes out on stage and the first thing he says, fuck, this rain's awful. <laughs> it's just, just like, <laughs> but there's just no doubt. It's like, oh, I know exactly what he's doing. Yeah. So I think I've learned over the time the power of like a little bit of a smile and a little bit of like looking a little bit smug and like just being self-aware of like, oh, I know what I'm doing mm. i i'm i'm doing this on purpose this is not because i think the worst spots i've ever had and the worst bombs are always when it's a room of people it's like i think he just means this <laughs> and that is fuck, that's, where, where are those what because it, it is I, uh, your style like your style and doing what you do there is in some ways because you don't compromise or change gears there, there, it's a higher risk thing because mm. if it's not hitting, like I know you said, well, if they don't like this joke, then you know, yeah. I've got the next joke if they don't like. But if they're not on board for any of it, because it's all 
because it's a it's a particular point of view you're yeah. putting across. Um, that 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 is like a. Do, do you ever get that feeling like three jokes in you're like oh, if you're not into this, there's a lot of bad stuff coming or. Uh yeah, like I'm trying to think. I mean, I I think over time I've sort of um gotten better at mitigating that. I think when I feel that a lot is when I'm trying to run a lot of new, and. The fuck, it's uh, Louis C.K. has talked about this in like his own version of this, which is like sometimes you need the crowd to remind you that what you're saying is fucked. Because <laughs> I go on stage with like a list of like this is killer shit, and then they're like, oh my god, what? And then you, and then the worst part of that, and to your point, is like, oh, I thought I preloaded the easy stuff up front, and you're hating that, and yeah. it just gets more questionable after that. Um, so yeah, that that can it's usually when stuff is is totally new and i have underestimated how it comes across to an audience that number one doesn't know me at all and number two hasn't seen me do it well and now i'm just jumping straight into doing it badly (laughs) it's like at least when you start off and you've got like a really dodgy joke but it works they're like oh i see what he's i see what he's doing yeah yeah. we see why the the, he's done it before it was funny and then later on they're like oh he's tried to do that same thing it's just not as funny Whereas if you lead with just like horrendously offensive shit that isn't funny, that it's like, is this guy just sharing his opinions right now? Uh, and yeah, that I had, a, I had a fucking well, the the one time I remember like notably walking in a small crowd, walking half of them, uh, because to be fair, they were one group, but they fucking hated me, and it was just it was that thing of like being on stage and feeling very like misunderstood, where it's like. Because so much of it, whenever you try to do irony, right, you're, you're trying to make the opposite point of what you're saying. Mm. And when people don't get on that, they just really think you believe the point that you're trying not to say. Oh, man. So where was this? Where This was in one of Skinner's rooms. I'm so lucky it was with so Skinner being a guy who books me a lot and has a lot of faith in me. But even he was pissed. <laughs> um, <laughs> is it a room that doesn't exist anymore? And I won't take responsibility for that. But it was that... But it uh, did never come back after, after that. After that, yeah. After yeah, all yeah. the complaints. Um, but it was at, uh, it used to be called Carousel, I think, it was on Oxford oh, yeah. Street. It's fucking bleak. I felt so bad afterwards. It was like, everyone had a bad night, but no one had a worse night than me. <laughs> Who was on after you? That's, that, that's always I was, the I was, I was closing the half. Okay. So whoever's in the second half is just going, well, thanks. You've lost half hour. Or, well, how are the other comics about it? Or did they find that funny? I think some of them found it funny, but not many people were laughing with me about it. So I don't know. I don't know. It was like... <laughs> in fairness, that, that is... Like, I'll never laugh at a comedian who's bombing unless I mm. respect them as someone who doesn't... Doesn't Louis was a king crush. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. if I see one of my friends who I know does really well, if I watch them bomb, mm. I, it's the most entertaining thing in the world for sure. Because I know that something's gone wrong, or the audience is wrong, or there's there's something's just amiss, and it's it's fun to watch that. But if it's so, any comedian like my, I find sometimes that that's a sign of respect. If someone's mm. if someone's enjoyed your bomb, yeah, th- then that's that's to me. I'd much rather have another comedian say to me, oh man, jeez, yeah. you ate shit. And they go, hey, it wasn't as bad as you think yeah, it is. It I'm like, good, there's some good stuff in there. Yeah, like, don't feel sorry for me. Yeah. Just tell me I ate shit. It was just, I remember in particular a couple of comedians who, like, I know well enough to be on, like, first name basis with, but, like, are not friends and who were a lot more established and better than I am. And just be like, oh, I would have liked to have done well in front of them. So oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the truth is, and let's be honest, they're probably not paying that much attention because we're all oh. in our own fucking heads. Yeah, what's the, there's a really great quote about, like, uh, you'd care a lot less about what other people think about you if you knew how rarely they did. Yeah. And it's like, no one's ever thinking about you. No. Um, we're all wrapped up in our, especially comics on a night where if you haven't been on yet, you're watching, thinking of your own stuff. For or sure. going, okay, this audience is a bit weird. Or yeah. that went, like... So, and then to be honest, I would much, like if you and I are on the same gig and I'm on after you, I'm much more likely to pay attention to your set if I, if I notice you're bombing. Yeah, okay. Because I'm like, oh, this is, this is, what's going on here? What's going, what's he said? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, am I going to have to tidy this up? Yeah. yeah. No, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know. No, not that, not even that. It's just, I, I just find that's to me is more, like in some ways more fascinating because I've seen you crush. Oh, thank you. So I know that. I know what you can do there. Mm. 
I haven't seen you bomb as much. And yeah. The bomb, the bomb, and it's not, I mean, it's not good for the audience and not good for you, <laughs> but, you know. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't, I, I think the, the style that I do, I don't know. I, it's, I definitely sometimes I'm like, well, I think I've figured it out. I don't think I'm ever going to bomb again. And then you're like, oh no, here it is. Yeah. Um, I take it you don't do corporates. No, I don't. Yeah. I don't. This is the thing. I have no idea how I'm ever going to make money in comedy because I can't do the things that pay. Yet. Yet. Yeah. But that's and that's the thing. Like it's, I don't know. Like there's, you can either. That's one of the things though. You can you can either approach it as though okay, I'm in this to try and just make. I'm, I want it to just make money. And then if you move to make money, you move so far away from what you wanted to do mm. that you're doing something different, but you're making money. Well, then why wouldn't you just get a job doing something else? Yeah, it's for not, sure. Like if you're not satisfied creatively doing what you're doing, why wouldn't you just get a much more secure job? Yeah, it's yeah, a, yeah. It's a dumb career to choose if you don't love it. If you're looking for security. Yeah. yeah. Or if you don't love it. Like you can, you can deal with the, the lack of you know, conventional security, if you get up every day and you're like, oh, I'm glad I'm doing this. Mm, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think um, I was watching, um, I was watching uh, that David Letterman Netflix show, um, My Next Guest. Oh, yeah. Uh, My Next Guest needs no introduction. Anyway, Billy Eilish was on it and they got Billy Eilish and Phineas in like the producing suite in their house or whatever and they got Dave Letterman to like sing on this track and he was so like embarrassed about doing it and they're like it doesn't have to be good like we're just making something for fun and they kind of like fucked with his voice and whatever and it's just that reminder of like oh you, sometimes especially when you get kind of good at something you feel like well if I'm going to make something it's going to be fucking good to be worthwhile yeah and to watch that and I was like I remember especially with music like I always put so much pressure like every time I tried to make a track on like a, a laptop or whatever I would get so wrapped up in what the right way to do it was or if this was good or not I was like, I wonder what it would look like if you just kind of went to make whatever, just tried to make something that you thought was fun. Do you think that's the flip side of your your comfort within the rules? Mm. Of like, that the, there is a right and wrong way to do yeah. these things. And then, you know, if you do it all right, then it should be good. I think so. Yeah, I think you're probably right. I think I can get a, a little bit too, uh, probably too analytical and like, if I, I definitely believe in like, like you know, there's a perfect combination of words for this joke. You know mm. what I mean? And less than that is never going to be as good, which I don't think is really the most effective way to think about this stuff. No, well, I, d I don't know. I think there d it depends what kind of stuff you're trying to do. Like there is, there is something to precision within mm. within writing and wordplay. But it, it once again, it's down to the style you've chosen. Like for me. If I'm too locked, I'm not a good enough performer that if I'm too locked in on word perfect, it just looks like a guy reading something on yeah. stage. I've got to, I got to go up with dot point type stuff where I know, I know what I'm going to say, mm. but if if I fumble the wording, if I'm not quite word perfect, or if I phrase it slightly differently, um, then then it it can't matter. My big thing is I've got to remember why I thought the thought was funny. Yeah, yeah, I know that thing. So what? Okay, what would be? What's the dream response for you from a crowd? So an audience member walks away saying the best thing they could possibly say about you from your perspective. What do you want them to think? What do I want them to think? So like for example, again, Muggleton talks about how he's like he wants there to be as little uh, space as possible between the person he is off stage and on like he wants to be like just the most him on stage like that's kind of his north star yeah i think probably i i honestly i want people to walk away going that was really funny if they thought if it, they thought of something slightly differently because i got like my stuff's mostly pretty light or whatever but mm. there's a few things where it's just a little perspective thing in there that occasionally people will pick up on and say to me, oh, I never thought like thought of it like that. Mm. But you don't. I want them to be able to enjoy the show on whatever level they want to enjoy it on. Yeah. So there's like it was like when I was um when I did when I um post COVID I went and did a couple of gigs where there was a couple of times where I had some anti vaxxers in the audience and some real pro science people in the audience. And it was very clear. Mm. There was a real dichotomy. And um I had a bunch of COVID jokes and afterwards I had people from both sides come up to me and, 
but the the anti vaxxers go, mate, love the COVID stuff, showing that it's all bullshit. Mate. You're, just, you're undermining the whole thing. And then people are pro science, mate, way to give it to those anti vaxxers. Yeah. I'm like, you you've come along and you've taken away what you want. Like what I said, I would believe 100. percent Yeah. In and then there are people that get exactly like I wasn't trying to pander, mm. but the ability where you know what, either side can go and have have a good time, mm. and no one knows that secretly. I think science is witchcraft. What's <laughs> <laughs> because it is? Yeah, yeah, no, but that's that's the that's that was that sort of a thing that I stumbled on. I'm like, oh, okay, okay, I'm actually not as in control of what they think. Yeah, that's um. It's kind of scary, isn't it? I mean, like, I remember my show last year, a f- comic book friend of mine came along and uh, he was at the urinal after the show and there was a guy who was there, the crowd member, just like a punter, and he was talking to him and uh, he was like, oh, what did you think of the show? My the comic, the Lokash, said to the guy, he's like, what did you think of the show? I was like, yeah, it was good. Jesus. What? Why would you ask? Well, I mean, I don't know. I don't know why I asked. But he asked, I think he might have seen him enjoying it whatever. He's like, what do you think of the show? And the plug goes, yeah, it's pretty good. I think he could have gone harder on the juice. And that, I have I, no idea whether it was ironic or not. And if he's being ironic, he's my perfect crowd member. And if he's not being ironic, he's the worst case scenario. You that, know? But that, and that's the thing. You don't get to... When you, you sort of realise at a certain point that you don't have control over everyone's bringing their own interpretation of what you're saying yeah and it's not even like because i i think um again back to the irony thing like there's one version of that which is they take you at face value which is is kind of like frustrating but also kind of fair enough where it's Mm. like well those those are the words that i said and that's not how i meant them but i maybe didn't do a good enough job of communicating my intention Mm. but the other version of that is like when they read between the lines and just make up their own interpretation it's like no fuck you like that's and i think you know that is the thing it's it's never i don't think it's probably malicious i think everything's kind of like a rorschach test right like you kind of project yourself over everything that you see but there are some people who are pretty happy to be pretty definitive about like, oh, you meant this. I'm like, did I? Mate, I've had, yeah, I've had weird interact. I remember I had a guy come up to me after a, um, after a show at the Sydney Comedy Store and he goes, oh, mate, that was really good. That was really good. Like, mate, you've got to do more leb jokes. <laughs> and I said, do I do any leb jokes? That's he goes, like, no, but you should. Problem. You should do some. I'm like, I've got no interest in them. I'm not Lebanese. How am I going to do? Like, what are you talking about? But, the, and that was one of those, he walked away, I'm like, does he think that I'm Lebanese and I can do Lebanese <laughs> jokes? Or does he think that I should do jokes? Like, yeah, he's giving that feedback to everybody. Yeah. yeah. Man, you've got to do more lab jokes. I keep telling people. But that's, and that was the, that's the, the sort of thing where you realise, oh man, like everyone's enjoying this on their own terms. Yeah. You have no... Even, you know, if they feel like one entire audience. It's it's like, you know, three hundred different experiences going on. It's such a um it's such an important thing, right? And I think um it's been very bizarre for me, especially over the last two to three years, watching some people that I do gigs with and a, a couple of mates, but mostly just like I guess colleagues, become like TikTok famous. It's very strange. It's just like, oh, wow, now that person's like a genuine... The person I just did open mics with is now like a genuine celebrity to a group of people. But then I think the reverse of that is like, you don't really get to select your audience. Like, it's kind of imposed on you a little bit. You, yeah, this is the, the, the flip side of, I think, some of the online stuff is it's fine if you're building the audience you want to perform to. Mm. But so there's people that get quite big... And then what they're putting online, that sensibility is their sensibility on stage. Yeah. Which is the, if you, if say, like to go back to Muggleton's thing, if he wants to be as close to him off stage as on stage, mm. um, if, you're, if you're that same sensibility, then I feel like the, the audience that come along aren't necessarily going to be disappointed or be looking for something else. Mm. But if you're doing one very different thing over here and then they come along to see you live and then they're like, yeah. Like I, to me, there's, there's, there's two sides to that. Like, one, what's the point of building an audience you don't want to perform to? Yeah. But then there's the other side of me that goes, well, if they're enjoying both sides creatively, then who cares? Yeah, I mean that's that does scare the shit out of me though. Like, and I've heard those horror stories of 
comedians who got massive and hate their crowds mm. where it's just like they've got to perform to people they don't respect and they've got to put up with all this bullshit and it's just like to your point like what is the point like it's just that sounds miserable and I feel like that is something that people who grow really really quickly just naturally fall prey to like I think there is something to like a slow but steady kind of gathering of the right people mm. um, but yeah I, I also think that the that if you grow your audience over a bunch of time then that they're more durable and are likely to stick with sure. you over yeah. time. Like that's what I've noticed um, when I was I was debuted touring with Jim Owen and his audience, uh, like he's he's built them over so many years that mm. there's people who loved him um, when he was you know first in his twenties and he was on TV. They loved him then and now bring their kids and they, their kids love him and that's like cool. so they, you know their adult children love him yeah and it's it's that sort of thing where the, he's built this over he's been part of their lives over time yeah which then comes with its own pressures because I realized I was performing with him like I'd go on every night and um, that there was almost zero expectation from the crowd because they didn't know one mm. they most of them wouldn't have realized that there was going to be a support act when i walk out they have limited expectation um you know a couple of them had you know knew me from rugby like the fox stuff but then what i'm doing on stage is pretty different is different to that yeah but um so the expectation the baseline was low so it was easy to clear the baseline and then i was i was standing backstage with one of the one of the sound guys and it sort of just occurred to me i said he goes, oh man, like you did really well. He must be worried about following that. I said, he, he's not worried about following that. He's worried about following 25 years of Jim Owen. Mm, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I wonder. Do you think so? What do you think? I mean, because... I don't know if he's worried, but that, no, I, that is what he's got to follow. He's following their... Cause I, and I know as... Because I remember, I came up recently for about... It must be seven or eight years ago... My wife took me for my birthday to see Jim Owen at the end mall because mm. he was my favourite comedian when I was a kid. Oh, really? When did you support it? Um, d just uh, I, the last last year. I was. Oh wow, that must have been a, a real thrill. Kids. It was, and he's like, I'd, and I'd worked with him a little bit before that, and he's just he's one of those blokes that just didn't really didn't disappoint when you actually so get to hang out with him. He's. Do you reckon um, comedians clear that bar more frequently than other types of entertainers? Musicians, I, especially, I guess, but in terms of working with people, you'd uh, living up to your expectations when you meet them. Yeah, I don't, having not hung out with a heap of musicians that I, you know, like really loved watching them when mm. when I was growing up. I, it's hard to tell, but I think that I think one of the beautiful things of comedy is is that you can be working with people you've admired for a long time much quicker than you think. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, I think so too, and and I think. But I, I think there is like an inherent camaraderie in, I, I think, no matter what level of the journey you were at, whoever you were working with who has kind of like cleared that, remembers that time yeah. and, and can relate to it and empathize with it. Um, and I also think there's something, I don't know, I, they always, because I, I did jujitsu for a little bit. And, um, of course you did. You, uh, no, you listen to podcasts. I just, I, just did, I just did what Joe Rogan told me for about six years. <laughs> um, and... They, like a big talking point that Rogan talks about in that stuff is like, oh, it's martial arts kind of weeds out egos because everyone gets fucked up at some stage. Cause, mm. and, and I think comedy is a bit like that. I think comedy like really certainly doesn't weed out egos, but it's like it, it humbles everyone at different times. And I think those people who stick around for 10, 20, 30 years, it's hard not to carry that, like that the kind of feeling vulnerable, feeling human, I guess, because mm. you've had those moments where you've just like being really truly humbled oh yeah and that's and the the other thing is is even even when you're really good you can still have a bad set yeah something can happen that can upset the apple cart and not go well um obviously that that expectation changes what i'd consider a bomb now um would be i would have been very happy with in the first couple of years sure, of doing yeah. comedy but you're supposed to get better yeah so, so the, those expectations move as well. But that's, but there, there is that thing. Like we've all, like, and even when you go on a lineup, like, you know, even some, you could you go on a lineup with someone who's got name recognition. You hear mm. the initial pop, but then after that first little bit of the audience excitement, they've still got to deliver. For sure. Otherwise, you know, you hear the it all peter off and the disappointment. Yeah. Begin. So, 
yeah, I, I think that's the that's the sometimes the flip side to that, and that would be hard if you've got big like on TikTok or whatever real quickly, mm. and to an audience that don't aren't necessarily live comedy people, and then they've come to see you, and then it's different to what they expect, or it's not what they thought you'd be doing. That that would be a hard adjustment to make, I think. I yeah, I also imagine just like performing to bigger crowds and on bigger stages is a skill. And if you take that slow and steady path, you get little doses of it and you get exposure and you get better at it. Whereas having to be thrust into it real quickly and t- and the amount of time you have to be on stage, suddenly people need to see you for an hour. Mm. If, if you're kind of new to it, it's that weird thing, right? Because most of the people who get famous on TikTok by and large, like they're not getting famous for their bits. They're getting famous for a thing they do. And then a live show is the kind of the way you capitalize on that or, or the, 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 the reason you, you do the other stuff is to get people in the door. Um, but yeah, yeah, to your point, it's like to suddenly have to deliver to that to people who don't really know what they're there to see. I remember a friend of mine um, told me he went to go see Alex Williamson early because like, I remember you know, in high school, a lot of his videos are getting passed around and being really popular. And he's like, yeah, I went to go see Alex Williamson live. And I'm like, what does he do? Like, I just, it was exactly the thing that we would be like, what would people expect from us? But it's like, does he, like, play videos of his clips or something? Mm. Or does he, like, talk about the AFL? I was like, no, he just did, like, stand-up comedy. I was like, oh. I just, I would not have expected that. Yeah. Um, and so all of those things are really, really hard to navigate. But I think especially, yeah, big stages, big crowds for an hour. It's like, you need to build your way up to that, I guess. I would have thought. Yeah, I, I, so I've got a similar sensibility to you in that I, I... And there are, there's, there's two sort of sides to it. There's what I didn't realize getting into this is you have to be actually good at, like, you have to be a marketer. Mm. You have to be all these, these things that are peripheral to the comedy. Yeah. Right. And my thing was always, okay, well, I'll learn the marketing when I've got something to market. Mm. Right. And now I've finally hit the stage where I'm like, oh, I'm actually, like, I'm good enough at this that I'm. I actually think that people could come along and see. Yeah. And now I'm trying to learn all that marketing stuff that mm. some people just seem to have um, and know before they've done the, the comedy. But I, I, would, I don't know about you, but I was just that, like, similar to you, I was didn't want to get people along to see me at something I wasn't ready to, for something with expectations that I wasn't ready to deliver on. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's that thing, like, I, I alternate back and forth between wanting to just skip to the end <laughs> you just yeah. like i was like all right i'm ready to be famous now not literally but you know what i mean like i'm ready to be successful i'm ready to start selling tickets but i think um i kind of yeah I, I don't think anyone who took the long way to get somewhere ever really regretted it at the end whereas i think a lot of people who took shortcuts knowingly or unknowingly can come to regret it or can be a little bit overwhelmed by it yeah, also, I think there's there's a lot of fun to be had along the way, too, mm. if you enjoy the journey of it all. Like, there's doing weird gigs, doing just being in weird situations, like doing road, sh- like, um, showcase tours mm. and that sort of stuff where you're with other comics and you learn so much from that. You have a lot of fun. You have all the experiences. And if you skip from when you first start to then all of a sudden you've got your own audience and you're building. Mm. I, I don't know, it'd feel lonelier, I think. And I guess all the milestones on the way there, like, because all milestones are relative, right? If you expect to sell a 1,000 tickets and you sell 800, you'll be spewing. If you sell, mm. expect to sell 100 tickets and you sell 800, you'd be on top of the moon. Like, Mate, last year I did my first ever solo show at the Comedy Store. Oh, yeah. So I, did, I just did a solo at the Comedy Store and that was one of the goals I'd sort of said I'd want to be able to do that one day. And it mm. took me took me close to 14 years, mm. but I did it. And it was one of those feelings where I walked on stage and then it went really well. But I walked off stage and I was talking to a mate of mine who um, is also a comedian afterwards. And I said, oh, that, that went really well. He goes, because you put in the work. Mm. He goes, you, you didn't, like, he goes, you knew by the time you were on stage that you could do it. Yeah. And I was like, oh, yeah, that, that, had the taking your time does sort of pay off in, yeah. a, in a lot of ways. Yeah, for sure. And then I guess it's that thing of like, in theory, there'll be the time you 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 do the slightly bigger venue and then the slightly bigger venue and slightly bigger, and you know, all the way down to the. I mean, I remember my first. I've kind of done it with the Sydney Comedy Festival from the container to 40 people to the terminal to 80 people to the factory floor to 130 people, and then you know the next one would hopefully one day the Comedy Store. It's like. 
all of those things felt great in the moment. Mm. Whereas if you skipped from one to a hundred, you don't get you, you know you don't get the cumulative effect of all those milestones. It's just another one of the milestones, right? Yeah. I think I think I don't know. I think I feel like you're you're spreading the joy out over. Mm. Over a bunch more time. I mean, we might just be justifying not being as successful. No, we're choosing to not be this successful. Yeah, I think. yeah, yeah. This is this is the the path less we're traveled. Empowered losers. Yeah, exactly. Empowered losers. <laughs> is that the name of this podcast? Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. But uh, but there's also like, I think there's stuff. There's weird gigs, you can start opportunities you get along the way that if you if you get too successful, sometimes you can skip. Like I've done like. You know, that weird gigs where you get to travel to weird places, do yeah. different things. And it just experiences that I look at now and go, oh, if I had have in the, you know, g- jumped to much more successful earlier, that's the kind of thing that's just not on the radar because you're out of that price range. Or you're out of that um, milieu where, you know, you can, where those are the sort of things you get booked for. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. You're right. Like the things that you, you think would be the most meaningful. I, I mean, I just... Uh, Melbourne Comedy Festival last year going to the end of festival like the wrap up party at the Exford and it's just like a bunch of comedians doing karaoke to YouTube with Domino's pizzas on tables and it's just like it's so not glamorous but also like I have such fond memories of it but but that's the that's the thing about um, comedy is like it's a beautiful uh, leveler where it doesn't Mm. matter what level you get to or what venues you play or what you do there's always the little things that bring you back to earth like Mm. there's like and and it's beautiful contrast of i remember doing a gig like i think i opened for someone at the end more theater full end more theater and like two days later did a morning gig for seniors (laughs) like at a local council yeah and i was like this is this is how you get the bands yeah yeah but it's but that's kind of the the joy of like, you know, it's it's not the same. It's not on the treadmill. Yeah. Like, don't get me wrong. I'd love to get to the point where I'm doing just end more, more end mores mm. than, you know, than Senior other gigs. Centers. But, but the, there's there's a lot of fun to be had along the way as well, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. I think so. Um, yeah, I, I think it is, it's so easy to get wrapped up in, in the... Um, in the dream of it all, but I do think then you get there, and and, and it's all a treadmill, right? You'll get to the end more, and you're like, well, why can't I do Acer? Or why all of that's, like, that's you 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 find no matter what you do, you keep moving the goalposts, yeah. and it is important every now and then to go, okay, if the day I started, I told you you'd be able to do this, this, and this, mm. would you have taken it? Yeah, like of course you would, massively. Yeah, 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 for sure. And I think it's also just like getting good as its own reward as well. Like I remember, just you know. Because I think I've con- I, you always kind of think that I'm I'm pretty good now, and then a year later you look back and that was okay, but this is this stuff's good. Like I I, I think it's really exciting to think. I've always kind of thought, well, now I'm seven years in. What am I going to be like when I'm ten years in? Fifteen, twenty. Like, I, it's just I I think I don't know. You've been around longer than, than I have. I've been sort of you feel this way, but it's like, do you think if you just keep doing it, you just keep getting better? If you keep working. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's not anything other like because i've seen people sort of pop it in neutral like Mm. you know you've got your set and you've got your like you've got your basically your material and whatever and they they sort of just stop writing as much or yeah stop working on it as much and that's that could like it's very easy to get to that point because you know it's pretty easy then at that like it's an easy life but it depends what you're after like if you want to keep getting better and you want to keep creating and you want to keep getting that outlet, then I think, yeah, the, there's no way not to not to get better at something that you just keep practicing at. Mm. Like there's no, I don't know about you, but one of the things I love, and sometimes I've got to remind myself, is I love that feeling of newish material when it's first working. Yeah. And it, there's, a, there's a real honeymoon period with a lot of it where... Um, because once you've got it working, but you're still excited about it, the audience feel that energy, and it sure. hits. So, there's a there's a honeymoon period where it hits so hard, where yeah. you don't, you're naturally excited and perform it the way you found it to be funny mm. before you know it becomes something where you go, okay, I know how this works. Yeah, I find um, every now and then you have stuff that you're just really excited to say on stage for the first time, 
and and sometimes I find I I'm trying to try stuff just because I'm like, is this does this work? Does this work? Like, I'm especially that festival model of like mm. I've done that the last few years. It's like I'll I'll do my Sydney comedy festival shows this weekend, and the way I see it, it's like on Sunday. I, I kind of want to, my last show's on Saturday. Uh, on Sunday, I, I kind of want to be thinking like, well, I want to use that material as little as possible because I need the next stuff now. Mm. And sometimes you're just like, oh, I wrote this down. Maybe this, does this work? Is this a thing? Um, but every now and then you have a thing like, oh, yeah, I, lo- I really love that. I can't wait to do And sometimes you do, you throw it out and, and it just doesn't work at all. And you're like, really? I thought <laughs> that was pretty sweet. That entertained me. How yeah. does it not entertain you? You guys get it, right? Yeah. It's, yeah, but that's, if you can remember that excitement, mm. that how much, when you, even when you're in a lull, how much fun that the adrenaline is of getting a new bit to work, mm. then I think that's the motivation to keep riding in a lot of ways. Yeah. Like, to keep yourself interested. And if you keep doing that, then I suppose, you know, you, you, then there's, there's no way not to get better over time. Mm. And that's the other thing is if you dip out, like comedy moves so quickly just in really subtle little ways. Like you take some time out and you come back six months later, the, the, things have just moved on just a little. People are talking about different stuff. People mm. are doing it slightly differently. There's, there's a different feeling in the air. And you try and do material that you'd written before that with, with that in that new environment and you can feel it's just just a little out of date yeah okay. it's just a little like you've got to really i don't know like i, I don't know for me it's it's very much about staying in it mm. um but i and just it took me a long like took me a while to learn but you've got to love the process of the whole thing because mm. that's all there is yeah there's only that's the only thing you can really rely on is the process because the outcomes will vary from year to year there's you know you'll get great opportunities there's some years where you'll feel like you missed out on every opportunity that you could have got and but in my experience you tend to end up where you're supposed to be mm. and you like if you just enjoy the whole process of it all then you're fine like put down do do the day-to-day work the career sort of looks after itself in a lot of ways yeah not agree with that I think it's been cool. I think I'm sort of at that stage now where I've seen a lot of the people who were fairly established when I started get the things they deserve. Mm. I remember starting and seeing people who I thought... I think I've seen two things. I've seen people when I started who we all loved but hadn't quite found their thing, find their thing. And that's been really cool. And again, these guys have been doing it for now would be 10, 12, 15 years. But it's like... I feel like I saw some guys really like work it out, go from very go from good to great, mm. and then I've seen some people who just sort of like just hang, hung around long enough, get whatever that break is, whether it's like a podcast that kind of takes off, or a TV role, or start selling huge amounts of tickets, and um, yeah, I, I think you're right. Like if, if that combination of if you're good and you persevere, it's not often you don't see that pay off. Yeah. And and it comes and goes in waves, as uh, Dean Lewis always says. So um, you know, back to music. Um, but that's and that's the thing. Like if you just if you you like uh, best bit of advice I got a few years ago before I went and did a festival was uh, made of mine. Nick Ratto is a Kiwi comedian. He goes yeah. set your goals on the things you can achieve. Yeah. He goes don't set a goal around ticket sales because you're not in control of exactly how many tickets you're going to sell. Set yeah. your goal around. He said, set your goal around, okay, I want to get better at this or I want to nail this down or I want this to be the best show I've ever done or I want to get good at transitioning from crowd work into a story or mm. I want to do a long story. Like he said, set the goal that you can control. Yeah, that's nice. So he said, still have those other goals, but have the one that you can control that you walk away, no matter what else happened in the festival, you can walk away and go, did I achieve that? And the bit that was in my control. Yeah, that's good. That's very good. Yeah, smart man. Now, um, we are getting close to time, but before we go, a couple of things. First off, what does the, like we're talking about the, you know, the, the slow path, the fast path. What does, like, if in five years' time, everything's just laid out for you, what, what are you doing? Uh, I'd like to be selling, uh, my, my, I've always had a goal of, like, if I could sell, uh, uh, if I could sell at a 100-seat venue in any city I wanted to go to, that would be like a, a dream of mine. And I think it's like a big, it's a big ask really, but it's like, if I could go to London and sell 100 seats, if I go to Edinburgh and sell at 100 seats, like I'd be, I'd, that would be pretty great. Um, I'd love to tick off for some of some of those like big comedy venues. Mm. Um, I don't know how realistic it is, but you know, I'd, I'd love to go and 
do a spot in like a, a the cellar in New York or at the store in in LA or that sort of stuff. Maybe that's a bit out of scope. But then, and I think I just I would love in five years to have like two or three, maybe two, like really great recorded specials. Um, I think like I've recorded stuff in the past, but I've always seen it more as just like a, a compilation of whatever I did for that year. I'll record my show this year just because to have it. But I would love to have some stuff where it's like, yeah, this feels like a piece. Like this feels like a like a concrete thing. Mm. I think a lot of that just comes back to like I I would really love to just keep doing the festival thing and just keep growing. Like just I, I think this year I I was kind of evened out for tickets this year to last year, but I think it was a it was a tough festival this year. It sounds like, but just kind of keep tracking upwards, do a little bit of a bigger room every year, or get a few more people in the door every year, and just do a better show every year. I think. Um, and then I think that because I do the podcast with Dan and, and Hamo, it's called Flog Cabin. You should give it a listen. Um, that was the next thing I was going to do. Plug whatever you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I think yeah, turning that into something would be quite cool, like building a bit of community around that. I've really enjoyed doing it with those guys and, and it already kind of feels like we've started to build something. So that that's probably a thing. But I think, yeah, it's just like getting better at stand-up and just hopefully finding the people that like it. Mm. Mm. That's, they, they, yeah, they sound like good girls. I, I like that. That I'm, It's interesting that you you are aware of your ticket sales and that sort of stuff because that's that side of stuff. Like That's the other thing. I didn't realise that I'm supposed to approach this like a business. Yeah. But, um, you know, what are you, what are you going to do? It's just like I, I probably spent a, a year thinking about it too much like a business because I just, it's, I genuinely think, especially for... For someone, I think in this time right now, where we've kind of, I don't know, you, everyone, I think you always think you missed the golden era, right? But I think we, a lot of, the first gold rush of social media has happened, right? Mm-hmm. Of that kind of like TikTok thing or whatever. Um, to be as far in as, that I am, as I am as to not have been like plucked out of the masses and, and put on something, you know, you kind of always hope that you'll be the one where they're like, Come with me, you got the golden ticket or whatever. Um, and then it's just like, how do you make money in this? Like, how do you how do you turn this into a career? And it feels like so hard to do in this country, especially. I think. Um, and it is just like to think about it like a business. You're like, who would ever invest in this business? There are so many competitors and f- so few customers. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. oh, that was actually five years. I'd love to go and spend some time, probably in London, maybe New York, probably more likely London. I'd love to go and live in like a real, real like big comedy scene. Um, I think you know, in being in a new environment like that, you'd grow a lot in a short amount of time. So that's something I'd like to do. Yeah, fair enough, mate. Um, now plug. So you plug Flog Cabin. Flog plug Cabin. Uh, your, stuff. your podcast. Uh, I'm at Tom Whitcomb Comedy on Instagram and on TikTok. I have uh, my la- I have a YouTube special called Ignorant, which is online. I'll probably put out another one relatively soon. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. Excellent. Mate, thanks so much for doing this. Thank you for having me. Cheers. Cheers.